very much. So Bill House round of applause for the year. So we'll give him a very good round of applause at the very end. Okay, well, turn this over to you. Very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. All right. All right, hi, I'm Will. I'm a third year cognitive science major, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about creativity, um, which is a concept that there's a lot of ideas floating around, uh, like popular uh, discourse about creativity, um, some of which have uh, more factual basis than others. Uh, um, some people see creativity as like a, a skill or a um, some sort of innate ability possessed by only a few geniuses. Um, some people see it as the product of some right brain, left brain uh, predisposition, which is false. Um, and <laughs> some people uh, see it as kind of a domain specific process that you can only really employ in um, areas like the arts or music, writing, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, but really, uh, creativity is the mo one of the most written about, most talked about, most uh, TED talked about um, <laughs> concepts. <laughs> that in existence, um, but a lot of what is said doesn't have a lot of scientific backing. And um, what we're going to try to do today is to go through some of the science underlying um, uh, creativity. <laughs> creativity. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get to defining it. Um, we're going to start thinking about it less as like a skill or a, a, um, a predisposition, predisposition and uh, more thinking about it as a fundamental aspect of human thought. Um, we're also going to try to erase the uh, right brain, left brain thing and um, uh, just agree never to talk about that again. <laughs> and um, at the end, we'll, <laughs> we'll have an obligatory how-to session on uh, being more creative in your everyday life. Um, so before we get to what creativity is, we have to kind of think about what we think it is. What are, what are our um, ideas about what it is? So um, I'm going to get like two two people to like come up with a, a good little definition. Um, have any volunteers over here? No? I'm going to pick someone. Addie. No, Mariah. <laughs> yeah. um, creativity is the ability to generate original uh, thoughts and new ways of thinking. OK. That's a good one. Anyone else? Thinking outside the box. All right. <laughs> one more. No, you go. Um, <laughs> say it at the same time. Oh. It might be the same thing. <laughs> Creativity is like combining things you already know. Ooh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's good. Uh, we'll get to that. That's, um, that's pretty good. Um, and that pretty much encompasses what most people would say about creativity. Um, but back in olden times, um, there were some different ideas about uh, creativity. In fact, in uh, ancient Greece, there was not really a concept that correlated with our idea of creativity, rather, um, an artist was discovering what was already there and bringing it to a viewer. Um, they didn't really have a term creator. They had discoverer um, and to discover. And this kind of pattern continues into uh, med the medieval age, where um, the, 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 the artist isn't really doing anything. They're, chan they're a channel for divine inspiration. So the idea is not attributable to the artist, but rather to God. Um, but up until up into the Renaissance and into the Enlightenment, um, this all changes. Um, <laughs> um, with, uh, with the Renaissance came a increasing um, emphasis on individuality, um, individual freedoms, um, individual abilities, and individual creativity. Um, the artist was responsible for their art and their ideas. Um, inventions were attributable to the inventor, um, and so on. And um, and then we get to the modern age. Or Diderot actually I forgot about this. This guy Diderot. Um, he had a he had an idea that was pretty close to what you said, which is that creativity is um, not anything. You're not coming up with new things. You're putting together things that existed in novel patterns. Um, novel, mashing novel concepts together. Um, but then we get to the uh, modern age where uh, Alfred North Whitehead <laughs> actually coined, <laughs> coined the term uh, creativity, the modern term, in 1927. So it's, that's very modern for something that we use pretty much all the time. Um, and he basically, this is kind of a metaphysical idea about uh, uh, entities, that all entities have 
some kind of creativity. Like a tree has creativity, but not a lot. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> mainly bound by uh, uh, nature, like causal forces, whereas he thought humans had the most creativity that anything could conceivably have on Earth. Um, and this, this kind of forms the basis for the operational definition of creativity, um, which is the ability to produce something that is both a novel and yet appropriate solution to a problem. Um, this is the definition that most psychologists and neuroscientists are running under. Um, but we have to kind of break this up. So if something, uh, it, you, it can't, you can't use the term very specifically. You have to broaden that out to anything, an action, a sentence, um, a piece of art, a solution to a math problem. Um, novel um, doesn't need to be objectively new. It just needs, you need to not know about it. It needs to be not explicitly stored in your memory. Um, useful, again, confusing term when you think about art, because like, what use is a, a, a beautiful piece of art? Um, but that's a topic for a whole different <laughs> discussion. <laughs> um, and problem. So um, the, the, the word problem is problematic um, <laughs> when <laughs> using it with um, art. But it, it'll make sense as we move forward. Um, but now we get to what is actually known about creative processes. And um, so um, when you're starting to study a construct, you have to really narrow down what you're looking at. And you have to, um, to find a, a, an activity that is where the process is being isolated. And one of the process, one of the activities that uh, some neuroscientists have started looking at is uh, musical improvisation. So if you think about a jazz pianist um, completely improv improvising with a band, right? So they have a key. They're playing within a key, but they're creating something that has never been played before, never been heard before. They did, may not even know what they're playing, but it has to sound good, so useful. It has to um, fit within the problem, which in this cir circumstance, the problem is a song. So you have to fit within the constraints of the song, the key, the rhythm, uh, coordinating dynamics with other players. And so what uh, Charles Lim, this is not a picture of Charles Lim, this is a picture <laughs> of the <laughs> fMRI machine. <laughs> uh, what he did was he put jazz pianists, pianists in, in a fMRI machine and had them improvise. And, um, compare this to them in the fMRI machine playing a pre-composed piece. And what he found was that um, the executive network, which is a loosely defined uh, area in the prefrontal uh, cortex, I won't go any more specific than that because it's really going to get useless. Um, <laughs> but all you need to know is that the executive network is uh, used in, used in um, activities that require a lot of focus. So for instance, doing a hard math problem, you have to lo logically puzzle through a lot of things. You have to focus in on the problem you're doing. Um, this area decreases in um, activity when um, pianists are improvising in the fMRI machine. And the default mode network, which is also very loosely defined and spread out across the brain, ramps up in activity. And so what the default mode network is, um, it's active when you're daydreaming, it's active when you're dreaming, it's active when you're just resting, sitting there, um, just imagining things, imagining future scenarios. It really encompasses a broad array of um, instances where you'd be putting together concepts that aren't, haven't been experienced yet. You, ha you don't have a specific experience stored um, that represents that experience. And uh, the way this pertains to jazz improvisation is that when the default mode network is active, the, um, the pian pianist is uh, putting together pieces of just notes that haven't been put together before. He's letting that flow through. And the executive mode network, the executive network um, kind of shuts off and lets these combinations of notes flow through. Um, you have to know, realize, though, that the executive mode network. The executive network is not useless. Um, in fact, it's if uh, if you imagine um, no having no control or no restraint over what you're playing 
um, would sound awful. You have to keep stay within the key and the rhythm that um, your the song is in, and that's the use of the executive uh, function. Um, but this is another example of um, something we'll use to understand the, the two the two network model. Um, this is an example of a divergent thinking problem. So. Uh, think of as many different uses for a tire as possible. So how about let's get some ideas going. Uses for a tire. Swing. A swing. All right. Little kids rolling a tire down a hill. Sweet. All right. A leg rest. A leg rest. Inner tube. A tire. A tire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. The recycled playground material. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good one. Um, so this sort of problem is used in, uh, in behavioral psych to um, measure the amount of creative thinking going on. And <laughs> um, the more uh, uses that you're able to come up with, the higher score you have on this test. And these are just a few possible uses. You got like a bike rack, this weird like saber, oh, this weird like saber tooth thing. These are actually like watertight pots made out of like shredded tires, <laughs> which is that's pretty, pretty, Pretty good use. Um, but what's going on here is the, um, hypothetically, it's posited that the executive network shuts off and allows uh, concepts and, that weren't explicitly tied together to um, collide and make new ideas. So I guess someone had the idea of a pot and then tire and then they mapped together and created this weird thing that I wouldn't want to have around my house. Um, but um, here's another example. Uh, move one line to make this statement true. Um, so you can move any of these lines in any direction, any orientation, only one of them, and to make this statement true. Um, don't shout it out if you come up with it. Um, but this is called an insight problem. And it might not be obvious how this is related to creativity, but um, What's, what the psych literature says is that um, when you're doing a problem like this, you can't really logically puzzle through it. You have to let it go. You have to look at the problem and um, let the unconscious default mode network do its work and put together things that may or may not be pertinent to the problem. So we've got. 11 equal sign plus sign, pretty related to the problem and probably related to each other. But you got what you ate for breakfast in here, Ace Barbecue, which that was on my mind pretty frequently recently. <laughs> uh, first grade arithmetic, that doesn't really help at all, but like it might remind you of something that you did in first grade. I don't know. Um, but what's going on when you do a problem like this is you have to um, look at it and just let it go. Just don't think about it. Just look at it, and everyone should do that right now. Just don't try to move things around. Um, and raise your hand if you think you have it. Ideas, how, 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 how we do it. OK, so the vertical line in the plus just from the whistle looks like a sub, yeah. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's, so that, that sort of thing comes to you in a, how did that happen? So what did that feel like? Did you, were, did, were you like moving them all around or did it just like? Moving them all around. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next point. Uh, <laughs> well, you got lucky. So, um, but executive function is still important here. Because um, you can't just generate a whole bunch of random ideas. Like they, these are not solutions. Like you could come up with them, but they're not. Um, and you need the executive. Uh, to tell you that that's that these are not solutions. Um, <laughs> um, so that's what creative cognition is. Um, that's one interpretation of it. There are numerous. This is a pretty well accepted version. But the takeaway, really, one of the takeaways. We'll get to other takeaways when takeaway time happens. But um, the takeaway is that everyone has these parts, and they're not. Um, stronger uh, for anyone, but people are better at uh, employing the getting into these modes of thought um, than others. 
But uh, as I just previewed, we have a few quick tips to be more creative individuals. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and this is all based on behavioral psych literature, um, and we'll try to understand these examples through the uh, two, mo two uh, network model. So the first one is lose focus, and this is based on <clears throat> some studies of um, ADHD um, patients and other, other uh, instances where um, people um, have trouble focusing. And it's been shown, demonstrated, that people who ha have trouble focusing, so anyone with ADHD, actually are higher achievers creatively. So there's a pretty standardized metric called the creative achievement um, test, and it just involves people listing creative achievements they've done. This is pretty broad, so it's like, mat, um, it doesn't have to be art, it doesn't have to be anything, but, um, it, where, where was I? Um, <laughs> the, um, the takeaway, though, is that um, sometimes focus can be a bad thing if you're trying to generate ideas, um, because you won't actually um, encounter concepts uh, that are unrelated to the problem at hand um, that could potentially be useful. Um, another is ig don't ignore the irrelevant. Um, this comes from an experiment where um, participants were habituated to a stimulus, which means that um, they were um, shown that it was irrelevant to the task at hand and that they shouldn't react to it. But um, it was demonstrated through, this was an automatic response to this stimulus that people who scored higher on divergent thinking tests actually reacted more to irrelevant stimuli than less creative people. It's difficult to parse out what this means, but um, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> um, but basically what some of the researchers thought is that um, creative people remain in contact with their sensory environment at all times. And um, that's a pretty useful thing to keep in mind going forward. Um, third thing, stay positive. Positive mood has been correlated time and time again with uh, creativity. Um, this study was done um, by inducing positive mood in a person and then testing them on a divergent thinking test. Um, the, you may wonder how, I can see your faces, you might wonder how that's done. They actually showed them like awful, horrible videos of car crashes to induce a negative mood and like videos of puppies to like induce a positive mood. <laughs> Ethical issues there, but. <laughs> so um, the, the idea behind this is that um, positive mood makes the um, number of concepts available to retrieve higher. So like the activity in the default mode network be higher and you're also um, more relaxed and less focused and stressed out. So you're able to retrieve things. Um, so disclaimer, um, what I'm about to tell you does not in any way, um, is not in any way uh, ad advocating for any sort of illegal actions, but um, I feel like it would be unfair to include this in the discussion seeing as it's been um, a part of discussions of creativity for a thousand years. <laughs> that's an exact figure, <laughs> that's the exact number, a thousand years. Um, and that's psychoactive substances, so you have to understand that if uh, creativity is based in neural systems, um, any substance that changes the way those neural systems function will impact uh, creativity. And the example I was gonna use is uh, caffeine, not illegal. There we go. Um, the uh, caffeine is a stimulant, which means that it uh, reduces fatigue, um, helps you focus, which, as we've learned, is a bad thing. So um, all those artists who rely on caffeine to get through hours and hours and hours of work, may, may, may or may not be doing themselves, uh, shooting themselves in the foot. Um, so you probably don't want to guzzle caffeine if you want to uh, come up with a lot of new ideas. But you might want to guzzle some of this, which um, <laughs> this is alcohol. Um, I'm not advocating for drinking, uh, but um, <laughs> uh, alcohol does uh, loosen uh, restrictions inhibitions of thought and uh, executive function, so it allows ideas to flow more freely. Um, but 
only to a certain extent. Um, the study that uh, we're drawing from had participants drink two pints of beer and then <laughs> do a problem solving test. And they solved the more problems and faster than the control sober group. Um, but you can't just drink a lot and, <laughs> and <laughs> function because you have to be able to identify that a problem you've come up with the idea or that an idea is relevant. Um, this is actually an IPA that is brewed by, um, let me check the name. It's, uh, I, I forgot the name, but um, it's, you see, you have the, your weight here for male and female, and you drink down to here, and that brings you to the optimal BAC um, for, to do creative problem solving, which, if you want to know, is 0.075%, um, so keep that in mind. Um, but again, not going to get into anything else, but just keep in mind what a drug's uh, effects are and how extensively you should partake. Um, and the fifth one is <laughs> be open-minded. Uh, openness to experience is a dimension of the big five personality inventory, which is a standard um, test of personality. And it ranges from um, not that open, which means you want to stick with like what you know best, not expose yourself to too much novelty, um, like hang out with the people that you already know, to very open, which means that you like novelty for novelty's sake, you like to engage in new experiences, um, and openness and creativity have been correlated many, many times. Um, the reason behind this is kind of confusing, um, but it's been looked at with um, samples of artists and bankers, like the most stereotypical like opposite people that you could think of. Uh, the bankers uh, came in about average to the general population on openness and on creativity skills, whereas the artists uh, came in above average on both and the study actually looked at their behaviors and to see why this was happening. And um, it was shown that the artists constantly were exposing themselves to new activities, um, just a rich array of sensory experiences, which the, um, the um, investigators interpreted to mean that they were getting more um, information. They were, they, they valued highly new information and had a wider array of concepts to draw from during um, creative, uh, creative activities. Um, and so those are the five tips that we have come up with. Only five. Um, and um, that's the end. And uh, one more. <laughs> Don't ever trust lists about being more creative because there are a lot of uh, uh, including this one, probably. So uh, thank you. That's all I have. And so that was a really creative different question. Right? Yeah. Ask a creative question. Right. That was a really, that was a really well done presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, absolutely. He was so nervous about so, this. I have to tell you. All right, tell me, why, tell me why I'm wrong about this. Okay. The very, one of the very first things you said was to dispel the left brain, right brain way of thinking. Okay. Um, and you go on to kind of describe two very different, like two distinct neural functions mm -hmm. being responsible for linear, like being responsible for right. logical and, and creative thinking. So like to me, that sounds like it right. is a, statement for the left brain, right brain thinking. Okay, so these areas aren't lateralized, mm -hmm. so they're not in the left and right brain. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is the left brain, right brain um, model is, um, it basically claims that you uh, generally, you say, so you say, oh, he's so left brained, like he's mm -hmm. like really mathematical or logical. That's the general, that's the biggest claim that most people have an issue with is that um, people use one or the other side, which is just nonsense. Like, <laughs> and uh, what was the rest of that? Oh, so I, I there are two, so there are two um, networks, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, 
I think the the big thing about that is <clears throat> that it's it's not it doesn't happen unless they're both um, I don't know the best way to explain this. I'm sorry. Um, I'm blanking, I'm shooting blanks. Um, but I know. Uh, God. Let me. Let me. Let me. Let me. Uh, don't let me think about it. Let me think about it. That's what I'm trying to do, guys. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Tell me and get back to him on that. Yeah, I'll get back get to him. Get to a relevant that. information. I'm not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> As probably most of these questions. <laughs> and Will said, we can videotape this, but he is not going to ever see it. He does not want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> we will never have to see this. <laughs> Another question. Yours? No other questions? Sweet. Yeah, no All right. <laughs> <laughs>